Spirit to come in. Just begin to pray in the Spirit for a moment. Yeah, God, just just those of you that are on the phone line, just begin to pray in the Spirit. Just begin to ask the Holy Spirit to come uh, into the lesson, to come uh, and, and minister uh, the Word of the Lord to us at this time. In Jesus' name, amen? Amen. We're going to chapter 12. Chapter 12. Let's move into chapter 12. Give me a Bible order. Right here. Please. You don't have chapter 12? Chapter 12, School of the Prophets, page 54. Understanding the glory. Now last week, we did Renewing the Mind. So we don't do Renewing the Mind this week. This week we're going into chapter 12. It says, For, for even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect, by reason of the glory that excelled. For if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remained is glorious. So now we're going to get into understanding the glory. Understanding the glory. God has always taken us from glory to glory. Glory rested on all of the former moves of God, such as the glory on the law. But there is a glory that excels these former moves. There was a glory upon the move of God's spirit in the 50s, the 60s, and the 70s. Certainly there is a glory on the move of God in the 80s. But the glory of the latter house is always much greater than the glory of the former house. The glory that is coming in the 90s is almost upon us. And it will exceed the glory that we experienced in the 80s. I believe that the glories of the 21st century will be even greater than the glory we received in the late 1900s. So when we're talking about the glory. So let's, let's kind of look at the glory. When you think about the glory and you think about uh, the Azusa Street Revival, you think about uh, Catherine Kuhn, Kuhn, Benny Hinn, he has a type of glory in his ministry. Um, when you think about Amy McPherson, her healing anointing, that was a type of glory. In the late 40s and 50s and 60s, you had the evangelistic anointing. Everybody was an evangelist. It was very popular to be an evangelist because God was restoring the fivefold ministry. And then you move from the evangelist into the pastoral ministry in the late 70s. Everybody, you know, because the evangelists, so many people were getting saved. Now people begin to um, take on the call of the pastor. And then as the evangelists came and the pastoral ministry came, now another type of glory was entering the church, that of the teacher. Now the teacher has entered the church. And then in the, in the, in the late 80s and the early 90s, then you begin to see the prophets come on. A whole different type of glory when you talk about ministering the word, when you talk about the deliverance. So now you have the apostles in the 21st century. Let's look at this. For if that which is done away with, done away was glory, it's much more that which remained is glory. But see here now, he's also talking, he's also talking to us about um, uh, the temple. He's talking about, uh, let's take Aaron's priesthood, for example. So we're not in Aaron's priesthood anymore. We're in the ministry of Melchizedek. Let's go into the book of Hebrews real quick and let's see if we can open this up a little more. Let's go around um, chapter uh, 7. Up around there. So, because we're, talk we're talking about glory. 
So let's look at the glory of the Old Testament and the glory of the New Testament. Go, go, go to Hebrews chapter. Um, go to chapter nine. Go to chapter chapter nine. It says, "Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and of a worldly sanctuary." For there were a tabernacle made, the first, wherein was the candlestick, and the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of holy. So now, they're giving you a description of the type of glory based on the utensils or the instruments or the vessels that was used in the sanctuary and in the holy place. So this was a type of glory also. But but let's go here. Let's go here. Go to verse 11. But Christ being come a high priest of good things to come. By a greater and more perfect tabernacle. Now he begins to show you that the glory is shifting. So the glory was in, first of all, a material tabernacle. Now he's putting the glory in a spiritual tabernacle. It says, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands. That is to say, not of this building. Neither by the blood of goats and cats. So now he begins to show you that the holy place or the section or the sanctuary or the holiest of holiest. All those things, like everything in here is made of wood and steel. But Christ is coming to fulfill all of that. Now a more perfect way. It's a different type of glory. Now I said, we're not just talking about the Shekinah glory that entered the temple. The Bible says that uh, that, that Hezekiah, that, that uh, Isaiah was talking about how the train of God filled the temple. How the glory of God filled the temple. We're not just talking about that type of glory. Because you as a woman, you carry a glory. The Bible said that your hair is your glory. But see, and, 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 and then the Bible says that our more uncomely parts are more glorious. The parts of the body that cannot be seen. The parts of the body that should be shut up away from people. So that's a type of glory also. So you have to look at yourself and see yourself in the glory. You are glory. You are a type of glory on the earth. Adam was a type of glory before he fell. Because there was nothing wrong with Adam. There was nothing wrong with the serpent until the devil entered his mind. That Tainted the glory and the glory left. So now, go back here. Let's go back to, uh, let's go to verse 6, chapter 6. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine, let us go on to perfection. This is where we're moving in the Melchizedek priesthood. This is where we're moving in this type of glory. When Melchizedek showed up to Abraham, he brought a type of glory that was called wealth. There was wealth in, 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 in the meal that he had. There was wealth in the words that he spoke. There was glory in the meal and there was glory in the words that you speak. There's glory. There was a glory release. The Bible says that Elijah says, send for me a minstrel. When that minstrel played, it was a type of anointing. And because it was a type of anointing, it was a type of glory. And when that glory filled the temple, a devil was cast out and Elijah prophesied. But when David played, a, day, a, a devil was cast out of Saul. So let's, let, let, let's go back. Verse 13, chapter 6. For when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could not swear by no greater, he swore by himself. That's a type of glory. A type of glory that says, because I'm speaking this word, it'll never be changed. And that's something about the church. That's a type of glory that the people don't even realize. That's why a lot of people, we we, we suffer under poverty because we don't embrace the blessing of Abraham. 
The blessing of Abraham is not just a spiritual blessing. It's an economical blessing. It's a financial blessing. And we don't want to take that on. The church don't want to take that on. But let me tell you something. Watch this. The church was never supposed to be non-profit. The church was supposed to be for profit because even Jesus told Peter, go down to the lake and get the fish and pay your taxes. He never tried not to pay taxes. And so, watch this. Go to, go to chapter 7. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, prince of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. When did Abraham get blessed? Not until after he come out of the fight. And when you come out of your warfare is when you get your greatest victory. When you come out of a season of war, when you've been in a tough season, when you've been in a tough spot, when things are not going the way you're coming out, God is going to reward you. And what God did for Abraham was brought him a king that represented him. In other words, God showed up in the form of Melchizedek. Wow. Let's go back to the book. Let's go back to the book. Let's go back to the book. It says, um, we're going to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and we're going to go to um, verse 11. Let's go to verse 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 11. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Okay, let's, let's look at this. Chapter 3, verse 11. For if, God, if that which is done away was glorious... Much more that which remain is glorious. Now, what, now, now watch this. I'm, I'm, I'm going to show you here. Um, go, go to Romans 2 and 7. Romans 2 verse 7. To them who by patience continue in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality. And eternal life. But unto them. That are contentious. And do not obey the truth. But obey unrighteousness. Indignation. Excuse me. And wrath. Tribulation. And anguish. Look at verse 10. But glory. And honor. And peace. To every man that worketh good. There's a type of glory on your life. You got to begin to see the glory that God has on your life. Go to Romans 4. I'm sorry. Go to Romans 14. And verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. So he's showing you, in other words, these Righteousness is a type of God's glory. Peace is a type of God's glory. In other words, in the glory. In the glory. Listen to the sound of the music. So within the sound of the music is peace. Within the sound of the music is righteousness. Everything you need is in God. And then when you get God, you get the glory. What's it? There's a place in the Bible that talks about the glory of God as being wealth. When it talks about Abraham, and you go back and you study Abraham, it says that his substance was a type of glory. So wealth is a type of glory. Watch this. Let me see. Go to... Um, Let's go back to the book. Now, go to Exodus 34. Exodus 34. 
and verse 29. And it came to pass when Moses came down from the Mount Sinai with the two tablets of testimony in Moses' hand, when he had came down from the Mount that Moses wist not that the skin of his face shone while he was take talking with him. Let's read on. Read, Apostle, to verse 35. Verse 30. So when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. Then Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the rulers of the congregation returned to him, and Moses talked with them. Afterward, all the children of Israel came near, and he gave them as commandments all that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. And when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would not take the veil off until he came out. And he would come out and speak to the children of Israel, whatever he had been commanded. And whenever the children of Israel saw the face of Moses, the skin of Moses' face shone. Then Moses would put on the veil on his face again until he went in to speak with him. And watch, this is a type of glory that was on Moses. Why was that glory there? Because he had spent time with God. And the more time you spend with God, the greater that anointing comes on your life. You know, when my wife and I first got married, for our first four years, we used to go to Nassau, to Miles Monroe's conferences, right? Eight hours a day, from nine o'clock until five. Then the main session from seven till about 11.30 or 12. When you left those sessions, I mean, you you you, you were so full. And, and, and people don't do that. I, I, for some reason in America, we don't do the intensity everyday conferences no more. They're full of psychology. I mean, so when you sit in this session for three hours, there's an invisible impartation that is penetrating your heart and penetrating your mind and penetrating your spirit. It's not about the hype. It's not about all the time trying to be excited. When them guys would sit down and teach, sometimes I'd be dozing off. And, 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 I mean... And you couldn't go nowhere because you stuck on an island. And his church was out in the middle of the island, so it was no such thing as, okay, I'm going on across the street to the store. You got to sit there and take that impartation. And when you have 60 nations sitting there in that conference, people then flew 10,000 miles, 5,000 miles. You think they want to be getting up, going to get a soda? I'm trying to show you their passion. These people were serious. And so they could sit there all day and not eat nothing, but they would be so full from the word. His conference this year is over 300 and some dollars. They got one person from Dallas, one apostle from Dallas that's been with him about maybe 15 years now. Daryl Wilson out of Fort Worth. He's the only guest speaker that's on that roster. He stayed with Miles Monroe. But I'm trying to show you how, how that glory comes on you. Let's go back to the book. In scripture, and we just read Exodus, some artists shows, read Apostle. Some artists. Some artists show horns coming out of Moses' head when he had gone this into this glorious countenance. People generally picture the devil with horns, but this should not be. In scripture, horns denote anointing, and Satan lost the anointing. Whenever a beast has a horn in the scripture, it typifies a false anointing or a false glory. Other artists have drawn Moses' picture with a halo around his head. They saw glory as a light that settled upon him. But when you go into the book of Psalms, um, watch this. Let me, let me show you the scripture real quick. It's in Psalm, go to Psalms 91. Psalms 91. 
Psalms, wait, look, is it 90 or 90? Let's see. Psalms 92. Listen to what it says. It says in verse 10. Those of you on the line, can you hear clearly? Psalms 92, verse 10. But my horn shall you exalt like the horn of a unicorn. I shall be anointed with fresh oil. So when you saw a person with horns, or you depict in, in, in these movies that they have people that have horns, they're satanic. But rep the horns represented the anointing. And here's another reason. The horns represented the anointing because here's the difference between Saul's anointing and David's anointing. Saul, this is a glass. When Samuel... With the Saul, it is said that he was anointed with a flaccid. A flaccid is something made by hand, material. But when you study the anointing of David, it says that David was anointed with a horn of oil. Meaning that that horn had to come from a dead sacrificial animal. Showing the sacrifice that David would have to make in his life. Where Samuel made no sacrifice. Saul made no sacrifice. You don't see Saul running from... The only thing you see about Saul, that after he was anointed, he went up. After David was anointed, he went down to go up. Let's go back to the scripture... It says, um, let's look at the word glory though first, okay everyone? Let's go to Genesis chapter 31. So we're going to go to Genesis 31. And he heard the words of Laman's son saying, Jacob had taken away all that was our father. And of that which was our fathers had he gotten all his glory. Look at, look at how glory is considered wealth. Glory is considered wealth. So that there should be a transfer of wealth coming to us. Amen. Say, Lord, let me see the transfer of wealth. Let wealth come to me. But you see how the see how we in the church, you have been taught that glory is the anointing and glory. Is, but here, glory was wealth. So your wealth can be transferred to you through your glory. Look at Genesis forty-five and verse thirteen. And you shall tell my father of all my glory in Egypt. Look how he's explaining. He said, go back and tell him of the glory that I have. Go back and tell him of all that I possess. My houses, my lands, my servants, my maidservant. Go back and tell my father. Let's, let, let's, get, the full, let's get the full meaning of it. Genesis 45, 13. Genesis 45, 13, because we're talking about glory in an unorthodox manner. Mm -hmm. Verse 13. So you shall tell my father of all my glory in Egypt and of all that you have seen, and you shall hurry and bring my father down here. Go, go to verse 1. Then Joseph could not restrain himself before all those... No, 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 no. Verse, verse 1. Um... Oh, I'm in the wrong. I'm in the wrong. I'm in the wrong. I'm sorry. 45.13. I'm in the wrong thing. I'm sorry. 45.13. Go to, go to um, four, Genesis 43 and 1. 43 and 1. Now the famine was severe in the land, and it came to pass, when they had eaten up all the grain which they had brought from Egypt, that their father said to them, Go back, buy us a little food. But Judah spoke to him, saying, The man solemnly warned us, saying, You shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. 
If you send our brother with us, we will go down and buy you food. But if you will not send him, we will not go down. For the man said to us, you shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. So here it is, a phantom in the land. Now let's go back to 45. The brothers are in a phantom. But look what happened when Joseph showed up. Start at verse 1. Then Joseph could not restrain himself before all those who stood by him. And he cried out, make everyone go out from me. So no one stood with him while Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud. And the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard it. Then Joseph said to his brother, I am Joseph. Does my father still live? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed in his presence. And Joseph said to his brother, Please come near me. So they came near. Then he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. But now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourself because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. Now see, now watch this. Now he's in charge he's second in command to Pharaoh and in verse 13 he said and you shall tell my father of my glory so glory comes with responsibility when you have responsibility you have glory Amen. and most of the time when you have responsibility you have also some wealth coming to you so get on top and stay on top Let's look at let's look at uh, th those were two scriptures that I wanted to show you that that deals with wealth because you 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 I know that we go to church and we're looking for a special anointing in the church we're looking for the power of the fall well why can't you look for the uh, transfer of wealth go back to Genesis thirty one. Genesis 31. Because this is a wealth transfer. When that glory is, let's say, Lord, transfer the wealth to me. Are you guys on the line? Okay, are you with us on Genesis? Okay, so we're going to Genesis 31. Going to Genesis 31. Now let's look at this. And let's go to Genesis 30 first. Let's go to Gen Genesis 30. And let's start at... Um, start at verse 25, Apostle. And it came to pass... When Rachel had born Joseph, that Jacob said to Laban, Send me away that I might go to my own place and to my country. Give me my wives and my children for whom I have served you, and let me go, for you know my service which I have done for you. And Laban said to him, Please stay, if I found favor in your eyes, for I have learned by experience that the Lord has blessed me for your sake. Now, now notice how when the glory is on you, that that glory is so heavily upon you that God bless other people because of you. So what you got to ask yourself, who is blessed because of me? That anointing that's in your life, you can't take your life for granted. And because we struggle in life, or because we have hard time in life, or because we have difficulties, or because we have challenges, it doesn't mean that you, the glory of God isn't on you. And so what you have to do is begin to appreciate yourself. Watch this. Verse 30. For what you had been before I came was little, and it has increased to a great amount. The Lord has blessed you since my coming. And now, when shall I also provide for my own house? 
So he said, what shall I give you? And Jacob said, you shall give me anything if you will do this thing for me. I will again feed and keep your flocks. Let me pass through all your flock today, removing from them all the speckled and spotted sheep and all the brown ones and among the lambs and the spotted and the speckled among the goats. And these shall be my wages. So my righteousness will answer for me in time to come. When the subject of my wages come before you, everyone that is not speckled and spotted among the goats and brown among the lambs will be considered stolen if it is with me. Go to verse 23. Thus the man became increasingly prosperous and had large flocks, female and male servants, and camels and donkeys. And now go to verse 31. Chapter 31, verse 1. 31, verse 1, 31. Cha chapter 31, verse 1. Okay. Now Jacob heard the words of Laban's son, saying, Jacob had taken away all that was our father's, and from what was our father's, he has acquired all his wealth. But in here, in this version, it says glory. So his manservants was a type of glory. So, in other words, this is... Now, now this is this is something in school of the prophets that you you gotta say invisible form. Invisible, invisible form. form. Okay. Say invisible substance. Invisible, invisible substance. substance. So in the realm of the spirit, glory is substance. But what glory does is change form. So the glory. That was on Jacob. Is this Jacob? Who's this? Joseph or Jacob? Jacob. So the glory that was on him, it changed form through his strategy and through how, how God had told him how to put these poles to make the sheep and the cattle ring straight or speckle. But the whole key here is that. There's an anointing on your life for you to attract wealth. Say, say, I, say, I have an anointing to attract wealth. Say, I have an anointing to attract wealth. Say, wealth come to me. Say loud, wealth come to me. Wealth come to me. See. Formless substance changes form. That's why when Balaam was riding the ass, the ass spoke. Because the substance that was in him wasn't giving him the right direction through the right vessel. So God took an unclean vessel and used the substance to speak to a vessel that was clean but wasn't obeying God. Form the substance, the substance that was on Jesus or the anointing that was on Jesus got on Peter. The anointing that was on Jesus, when Jesus spoke into his life that before the night was gone, you was going to deny me three times, a cock would grow. The substance, the divine substance changed form, shifted form. Remember, when we first started the School of the Prophets, we talked about uh, trans plumal migration, meaning that the transfer of the anointing into another destination. Trance to transform, plumer, wind, breath, migration to take up resonance. So when we are speaking the word to you over the microphone, there is a trance pluma migration where the anointing and the Holy, the anointing, the Holy Spirit, the interpretation of the Spirit is leaving the desk or leaving the throne room of God and resting on you. Trans pluma migration is taking up residence in you. And so just because you are sitting there and you may feel tired or you may feel bored, don't mean that the anointing isn't getting on you. Let's go back to the book. Let's go to page 55. First paragraph. Glory. 
Glory, which means prosperity, wealth, or goodness. What does glory mean? What does glory mean? Read, Apostle. It is first mentioned in Genesis 31 when Jacob worked for Laban. He worked seven years in order to take Rachel, Laban's daughter, as his wife. Because of the custom of that day, which required the older daughter be given in marriage before the younger daughter, Jacob ended up married to Leah. On his wedding night, when he went into the tent looking forward to Rachel, he discovered Leah instead. But God can take mistakes and incorporate them right into his plan and pattern. So Jacob began to receive children through Leah. Leah named the first son she bore to Jacob Reuben, which means behold the son. She hoped that perhaps now Jacob would love her since she had given him a son. She had a second son whom she named Simeon, which means hearing one. Leah hoped that now her husband would hear her. Leah's third son was named Levi, which means to be joined. Her desire was now that Jacob would be joined to her. The fourth son that Leah bore was named Judah, meaning to be praised. Leah desired that her husband would praise her. Then frustrated, then frustrated cries of Leah, the frustrated cries of Leah are evident from the name that she chose for her sons. God blessed the marriage of Jacob and Leah, despite the fact that it was a mistake. Wow. Wow. Despite the fact that it was a mistake, you can choose the wrong person. But he didn't choose her. The father-in-law chose her. Read. So, no, go, go ahead. So God blessed the marriage of Jacob and Leah, despite the fact it was a mistake. Is that the phone? That's why we keep your phone. If it had not been for Leah, there would not have been a Levi from whom the priest of the Lord was descended. And furthermore, they would not have been a Judah from whose house the Messiah was to come. Is that not powerful? Even though, now watch this, even though he loved Rachel, was it Rachel? But because of tradition, he couldn't give away the younger daughter before he gave away the elder daughter. So the father had to give away the younger daughter, even though in his conversation with Jacob, he would give him Rachel. So he ended up working 14 years for her. Wow. Genesis 31 and 1. And when he heard the words of Laban's son, saying, Jacob had taken away all that was our father's, and that of which was our father's, had he gotten all his glory. The glory that Jacob received from Laban's wealth, Haggai 2 and 9, also speaks of the glory in reference to wealth. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord. Wow. So that means that the anointing that's coming up on your, on your life now is going to be the it's going to be greater than the anointing that was on your life seven years ago. Amen. Amen. In the New Testament it says, But my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Philippians 4.19 The riches are in glory and they come in Christ Jesus. From these passages we can readily see that the glory is connected with wealth, riches, goodness, and prosperity. Wherever the glory goes, that's where the wealth goes. So what is what that... <laughs> Pastor, you got to read that again. Wealth is what? <laughs> well, wherever the glory goes, that's where the wealth goes. And from these passages, we can see that the glory is connected with wealth, riches, goodness, and prosperity. Wealth, riches, goodness, mm -hmm. and prosperity. This is glory. All of which they say the church should be. Right. Pe pe people don't want you to be wealthy. They want you to be poor. Philippians four nineteen. Let's read that together. Let's read that again. Philippians. Let me find it. Four, chapter nineteen. Philippians four, 
chapter 19. We're back, everybody. Somehow the phone cut off. We apologize. We're in Philippians 4 and verse 19. It says, but my God shall supply. Now, when you look at that word supply, it says to be complete, to finish, to furnish, to satisfy, to execute. So that means that everything that you're looking for, when God supplies, it says in Philippians 4, but my God shall supply all of your needs. Needs means lack. Anything that you lack. Now watch this. The word want means lack. So every time you say, I want a car, you know what you're really saying? I lack a car. So a car can never come to you because you're always speaking, I lack it. A house can never come to you because you're using the word wrong. If you keep saying, I want a man, you will never get him because you're saying, not that I want a man to come to me, but I lack a man, meaning that lack is in my life. And you keep saying it. Why? Because when you look at the word, the word is, in the Greek, it means something different than what it means in the English. In the English, the word wants mean, uh, you, you know, like a man want a woman. But in the Greek, it means to lack. So you have to stop saying what you want and start saying, I am. This is why Christ would say, I am the bread of life. I am the rose of Sharon. I am the lily of the valley. I am the bright and morning star. I am Alpha and Omega. So you have to get into the Jewish principle of I am-ness. Say, I am wealth. I am wealth. Say, I am wealth. I am wealth. I am wealth. Listen to what God told Moses. Say, tell the people I am sent you. I am that I am. So you have to start using that principle. I am that I am. Watch this. Do you know that Joshua was more than a millionaire? Do you know that Moses was more than a millionaire? They were billionaires. Billionaires. They had billions. They didn't just have millions. So when you're dealing with divine substance, divine substance has the ability. See, watch this. If you don't begin to think like this and hope like this and dream like this, you can't be like this. That's why they say everybody want to be like mine. You understand what I'm saying? So you have you have to in school of the prophets. You got to shift your mind from a church mentality to a mentality of manifestation. See, in School of the Prophets, you got to shift your mind from saying what you don't have to speaking forth what you desire, even though you don't get it right away. In other words, it's a constant warfare to determine that I'm going to get on top and stay on top. Say, I'm going to get on top and stay on top. Look at Kenneth Copeland. He got on top and he stayed on top. Look at Ron Parsley. He got on top and he stayed on top. Look at Bishop Jake. Since 1995, since when, when TBN saw that seven minute clip of him, he got on top and he stayed on top. There's a place where you get into the realm of wealth and creating finances where finances, you're not trying to create it, but it's looking for you to create more of itself. And that's where we got to be. You got you to gotta realize that wealth is your heritage. The glory of God is your heritage. And because you're a child of God, and you, 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 watch this, can I tell you, if God raised me from the dead, I want the best too. Amen. So because Christ died and got out of the grave, God gave him everything that was in the universe. But the Bible says that I was crucified with Christ. So if I was crucified with Christ, that means that everything on the planet got to come to me. 
He said, nevertheless, I live, but yet not I, but Christ lived in me. In the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who gave himself for me. So if I died on the cross and was buried with him and rose with him, that means I'm entitled to everything that he is entitled to. But what religion have taught us, because we come out of slavery and because we come out of poverty and we may be only one or two generations away from slavery, we have a slave mentality. And that's why God had to kill all the people that came out of Egypt. Look at somebody say, don't let God kill you. God killed all them people because of their unbelief. And, 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 and he had to kill that generation because 40 is a generation. He had to kill that generation because they didn't believe. You got to believe. We got to believe that he can do exceeding abundantly above all that we may ask. We just got to. We got to stop quoting the scripture and start going after the stuff we want. The greatest challenge that Christians face is to want something and be afraid to go after it. That's a hindrance. The second hindrance is to want something, go after it, and then deal with fear when you're in the office getting it. Because everybody is trying to say no to you. The third obstacle is to want something, sit in the office and get it, and then don't believe that God can keep it paid for. And so that fear comes up on you. And because you manifest that fear, the unbelief or the lack comes back into your life after you don't release your faith. Watch. Let's, let's look at this. Let's, let's, let's look at this. Go back to the page. It says, this is why we believe that the East Coast is on the cutting edge of the next big move of God. The skyrocketing real estate prices are not a coincidence, but are an indication of wealth and prosperity. You know, New York is so uh, expensive now. People that lived in the five boroughs, some of them are moving on the outskirts of New York. Um, entertainers uh, they can get better housing living uh, if you know anything about New York when you go through the Holland Tunnel or you go through uh, the George Washington Bridge or you go through uh, the Lincoln Tunnel you're right you, now you're in Jersey so the real estate prices in Jersey is cheaper than the real estate prices in New York so people are moving to Jersey and commuting back to New York because they can go right through the Holland Tunnel or catch the path train. Same thing in California. Let me tell you something. When I left here, I had a house in DeSoto. I paid $205,000 for that house. Swimming pool and everything. Five bedrooms. When I had to turn the house over, because one of the greatest mistakes pastors make is that when they get in a jam, they take money for their living and put it into their ministry. And then their ministry end up suffering. And then they end up suffering. So I did that. That was one of the greatest mistakes I made. And I lost my house. So I said, God, I want my house back. So when I got to L.A., everything was 700000 1,700 square feet, 1,600 square feet, 1,500 square feet, 650,000. No backyard. No backyard. Your backyard was as big as your garage. You know, just see square, walk out, put your trash, walk around the house. That's it. So my wife and I, we moved up into the mountain. We found a house for $405,000. Moved into the house. There was a principle that I learned from school of the property. I put that principle in the action. But, but what, what, what am I saying? I'm, 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 I'm saying that when, when God gives you something, 
when you when you're going after something, when when you know that there's something in your heart, you gotta go after it. I didn't know how I was gonna pay twenty seven hundred dollars a month, but we went after it, and God supplied that money. So a lot of times you have to go after what you want, and then the resources begin to appear. But also, you can't be a lazy Christian. The word lazy, it says the, the poor will always be with you. That word paucus means lazy minded. It don't mean that people are lazy. They lazy in their mind, not in their body. Their mind is lazy. So School of the Prophets have to teach you to manifest. That's why one of the greatest things School of the Prophets will do is teach you how to see. I'm, now, I'm not just talking about seeding because we, we take up an offering. I'm trying to get you to understand. You know, Reverend Run had a dream. In the dream, uh, 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 Russell, his brother, the sneaker company wasn't doing well. So, Reverend Run had a dream. He was in an airplane in London in Europe, overseas, and the airplane exploded. The prophets interpret the dream and say, ah, oh, there's about to be an explosion in your businesses overseas. The shoe company, in less than three years, went to making $100 million a year. Something like that. He was sowing seed. Run DMC was broke. Run DMC didn't have no money until they came. They started tapping into the prophetic. When he came into the prophetic in the 90s, they didn't have a lot of money. They were struggling like everybody else. They might have had a few royalties, but they they wasn't rolling the way they rolling today with that television program and Run's house and the sneakers and all that he's doing. No, that came from the prophetic. You see he wear that collar. Al Sharpton wasn't rolling until he started connecting with the prophetic. And so when you start connecting with the prophetic, one of the things is it's gonna it's gonna put it in man. On you to sow. It'll put a demand on you. You'll get to the place where you'll sow the five hundred. You'll sow the thousand dollars seed. You'll get to that place. But if you never hear it, and you just keep going to church, giving twenty dollars and giving five dollars, and not really making no sacrifice, ain't nothing gonna come to you. And ten years from now, you'll be in the same condition. There's a boy, there's an apostle I'm so mad at. I am mad. I've been knowing him 25 years. I mean, he was listening, listening to all of Bishop, all of the prophetic tapes, working at the airport, had a good job, and he wanted to buy a second car. Went out and bought. A, 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 a 20 year old car I saw the car I said man what's wrong with you all this revelation you getting and you gonna put your wife in that and you know what he ended up sleeping in the car then I found out he was into pornography and, and dealing with the prophetic and what had happened was because he had opened his eye gate up so much that when he got into that prophetic and he started looking at that porn, he opened another dimension of his eyes into looking at porn that he was sowing all his money into the porn. Same thing happened to Kirk Franklin. And he repented and look what the church did. Forgave him and look at the TV shows he's in. Until you learn how to sow, until you learn how until you sow till it hurt. You know, if my wife and I, we were sowing so much, it would hurt. We didn't have a thousand dollars to sow, and we would sow. We didn't have, when I sold my first ten thousand dollars, I don't even know how I did it. But I sold that first thousand. When I sold my first thousand, 
I started sowing my first thousand in '97. From night, from the time my, my my wife and I got married in 1989 of June, we always been on a hundred dollar level. No matter what, we always been on that level. When we started going to Miles Monroe, then we got on that five hundred dollar. Because you wasn't going to be in a week of meeting and you didn't sow a thousand or fifteen hundred dollars and then spend another thousand dollars on tapes and books. Then as we matured, now watch this, I'm going to show you how God worked. In 1993, my wife, I said, I said I'm going to get my wife a beauty salon. Get that picture off the wall in there. I'm going to get my wife a beauty salon. Didn't have the money, didn't have the money, but we were sores. We were sowing uh, 500 here, 200 here, 75 here. Every time my pastor had a revival, Bishop Blake, we would sow. I would run out of the church and go to the ATM. And I was working at McDonald's. I wasn't making a whole lot of money. When I first went to LA, I was working at McDonald's, $250 a week, and I was homeless. For seven months. I wasn't on drugs. But when I left school in Boston, I didn't know anyone. And I wanted to go to California because they used to tell me I was too black. I said, Mr. Brown, you'll never be a television broadcaster. You'll never be a radio person. You're too black. And I made up my mind, when I go to L.A., I'm going to learn American Standard English. And that's what I've been striving for ever since. But the thing, the, look on the wall, Elder, in the, in the sound system, you'll see a picture of anointed hand. But what I'm trying to show you is the giving opens up the supernatural. And it's not until you begin to deal with the supernatural that the natural go going to appear. So you can't try to get the natural functioning in the natural. The natural only appears when you move in the supernatural. And the supernatural is the spirit of giving. Not the spirit of keeping. And God will teach you how to give out of your lack. And that's what God had to teach my wife and I. How to give out of her lack. Because when my wife and I got married, and, then, and I'm just saying this now so you'll know, she was only making $60 a week. She had just graduated from hair school. She was working at a bank. She didn't want to do that no more. She wanted to do hair. Elder, you don't see it? So, so what I'm saying is, I'm going to show you what see. This was the first manifestation of sewing. You see this? This is anointed hands. This is the first manifestation of sowing. And when you look at this, that's 3,000 square feet. You see that? 3,000 square feet. 24 booths at $250 a week per booth. That's over $10,000 a month. This is what sowing did. You see that? Sowing brought us into owning our own business. Now get this, in Beverly Hills. Walt Disney owned that. Walt Disney's son. So he was dying of AIDS. So there was a lady in the church. She said, you know, I've been watching you. What are you going to do for your wife's birthday? I said, I'm going to get her a beauty salon. When I said I was going to get the salon, the money had already begun to come to me. Do you hear what I'm saying? In 30 days, it was $30,000 in Estro. And we walked, I gave that to her for her birthday. For her birthday. So it's not until you begin to move towards the direction you want to move in. I'm just using that as an example. I'm just using that as an example. But the Bible said when a man find a wife, he find a good thing and obtain favor from the Lord. So part of the favor was the fact that I knew my wife, the, the money came because she was the favor. You are favor and the Lord is your husband. And so 
if, if favor is on your life, you got to depend to put. You got to begin to put a demand on God, which is your glory, because He's covering you. Watch this. Let's go back to this. It says that. It's talking about the real estate in the East Coast. It said, I believe, last paragraph, that just as the original 13 colonies birthed the nation, God is going to send the flames of revival from the north, south, and from the south to the north as he birthed the new revival and move of the Holy Spirit, of his spirit. From Miami to Georgia, we will see those 13 colonies lift up once again with revival and the light of the Lord. You know, people don't really know where the next move is going to be. They're saying Texas. They're saying Texas. But I don't believe it's going to be. And the reason I don't believe it's going to be Texas because Texas has to repent for what they knew about Baker Edwards, for what they knew about Martin Luther King, for what they knew about John F. Kennedy, for what they knew about the Indians that lived on the Trinity River. We don't know where the next move of God is going to come, but it's going to be as a mighty rushing I told the church Sunday, I said, God has to raise up black women. No offense. But there's, we have the Joyce Myers of the day. We have the Marilyn Hickeys of the day. But where are the women of color? Where are the Menard Marty women? Where are the Hispanic women? Why we, why we don't have the big TV shows. So your glory is connected to your wealth. So when you consider glory from now on, just don't look at it from the church point of view as spirit. Somebody speaking in tongues or somebody banging on some instrument. Look at your glory in terms of how much wealth can you accumulate? That means your glory is the car you drive. Your glory is the house. Your glory is your children. Your glory is your family. Your glory is your manservant, your maidservant. You have to start accumulating things in your life. Don't stop accumulating. Lift your hands and say, Father, I lift my hands down. And I thank you for a new transfer of wealth. Glory, come on my life right now. Increase my life right now. In the name of Jesus. I just, come on, just, just, just open your hands up and let the anointing of wealth, let the, the transfer of the anointing, let it come to your hands. Those of you that are on the phone, lift up your hands and say, Lord, anoint, let, let there be an anointing of wealth on my hands. Let there be another type of glory on my life. Hallelujah. Let the glory come. Let the glory come. In Jesus' name. When you are in prayer this week, just say, Lord, let there be a transfer of wealth to me. Listen, you 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 can't always work every day. You gotta be, you gotta believe for the supernatural. You gotta believe that 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 the supernatural can come, that the supernatural can manifest in your life. Hallelujah. You gotta believe that. Got to believe that. Let's go to chapter 24. I'm not going to take a break yet. Chapter 24. We're going to chapter 24. Prophesying from the corporate or individual realm. Page 105. Page 105.
page, read apostle. The mentality of my ministry syndrome must be destroyed. Now, number one, you got to stop saying this is my ministry. This is not your ministry. You are a partner with God. You are a partner with God. You see that sign up there that says the Lord and dawn of a new day. That's the church in Los Angeles. It's not your ministry. Too many of us, when 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 God start raising us up, the first thing we do is, "This is my ministry." No, this is the Holy Spirit's ministry that is coming through you, and without the yielding of the Holy Spirit flowing through you, you don't have a ministry. And you can tell when people have their ministry because all you see is flesh. Read. The church must rebuke the lion demon of my ministry because there is no such thing as my ministry. When the part becomes more important than the whole, we have missed the purpose of God. And a lot of times we want to make, you know, and, and, and this is something with uh, rappers and singers in the church and choirs in the church. Don't be in a choir or don't be in a music ministry and someone is singing lead. And you feel you got to outdo them. That is so, so bad. What you want to do, always remember you want to compliment the person you come behind. Amen? Amen? That's one of the things that I really put a lot of emphasis on here establishing a five-fold ministry. Because I'm not the only ministry gift in the house. So when prophet gets up, I never try to come right behind prophet. No, I always get into worship. And if you're going to come behind somebody and sing, get into worship first. And usher in. Watch this. If you usher in the anointing of the Holy Spirit or begin to give praise and begin to thank God for what you are about to do and get the people involved with the thanksgiving and the praise and then begin to sing, now you're complimenting them and not trying to outdo them. Same thing with preaching. One of the things we have in the church, we have certain gifts. They are good at exhortation. They can get up and get a crowd stirred, but they can't preach. They can't teach. And and you'll find men of God, when you go places, they'll be preaching, and then the next man of God will want to get up and outdo that man of God. You can't do that. So whenever you have more than one speaker in the church... Get them to get into worship. Get them to follow. No, no, no. Don't try to come behind me and say nothing. We had a woman of God here Sunday. She spoke such an awesome word. Prophet said, I don't, I, don't, I don't need to speak. And so I knew I had to get up. I told the prophets, I said, put on the worship. We must have sung three or four songs before God began to deal with me about what I need to bring for the day. Never, never be in competition with anybody in ministry. I don't care if you go to another church and you got to come behind somebody. You come behind them in praise, in prayer, and worship. It, it ain't even about if the, if the service is up, don't bring the service down. Keep the service up, but do it with worship. And you bring everybody into a corporate worship and then you release what God gives. Never be in competition. Never think that you're the one like the Matrix, Neo. He found out he wasn't the one. But when he came to himself and found out that he had to compliment Morpheus. You, when, you, when you're in team ministry, you're, you're always complimenting. Read, please. Because the part should never supersede the whole. Some people leave their fellowship because they claim the leaders did not recognize their ministry. 
However, the truth is that the individual will not become a part of the whole. Some people leave their fellowship because they claim that the leader did not recognize their ministry. Well, I'm going to recognize pride, Pastor. Well, I'm going to recognize. You ever been to a ministry and they ask, you know, they may call a few people up and somebody going to lay hands and people will start falling out. Now you taking attention away from the original purpose of the Holy Spirit. When you go to another ministry, never try to take over that ministry. If somebody give you the opportunity to minister, you minister. But if it's four or five of you, never try to outdo somebody. Always look to compliment. That way, let me tell you something. If I lose, if I hurt my pinky, I only have four fingers to work with. But if I keep my pinky healthy, I have all five. If you hurt your arm, you only got one arm. So why would you hurt yourself? Inflict pain on yourself. Not thinking about the whole body, but just thinking about part of the body. Read. Your vision must die. If it's your vision life. must die. If you have people in pastors... That are on the line, pastors that are here. If you have people in your ministry and they always come to you, well, Pastor, I want to do this. And Pastor, I want to do this. Do their vision connect with your vision? When, watch this. When people are praying in your ministry, whatever they do is going to complement what the pastor wants to do. When I was at West Angeles in California, my first year all I did was pray my second year when I went into my second year God I started hearing the word evangelism and I went to the pastor's office and he directed me to El Dorando El Dorando was an architect he built houses but he was in charge of evangelism I wanted to teach a class. So I had to give him the book that I had wrote. And they let me start teaching the class. What, what did that lead me to? That led to one million dollars in advertising every year for four years in a row. I got the pictures. But what am I saying? Prayer. Those of you that are on the worship team. Those of you that are with Apostle Monica. Those of you that are with Apostle Lawless. When you're in prayer. God is not going to give you a different vision from the vision of the head. And if you get a different vision from the vision of the head, something wrong with your head. Because God is not going to talk to the body before he talked to the head. That's out of order. So what, whenever, some, whenever somebody is in intercession and they come up with an idea, that idea should coincide with that ministry. You cannot have two visions unless there is a division. That's why people leave ministries. Because they don't fully get the vision of the ministry. Or they start complaining about the ministry. Or they think the ministry ain't growing. A lot of times the ministry is not growing because it's not your season to grow. Because if any more people come in, you so stupid, you 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 lot to run them out. But you're just talking in general. But what we got to realize is that when God want to pour into a Pacific group, God trying to pour something into you that make you better than the elders that you meet. That make you better than the pastors that you meet. That make you better than the evangelists that you meet. That God is trying to pour something into you that bring you on a level under your apostle. Where you can compliment your apostle in leadership. And not just in partnership and membership. Because if you can't grow in leadership, you can't grow. And a lot of people in church never grow in leadership. They grow in membership. Leadership bring you the responsibility. 
You got to take the way. You got to be on time. If she say, meet me in Alabama, don't ask her how. Get there. When you are part of a team, God will, if God bless her, He blessing you. When you are part of a team, God would rather make love to a whole family than an individual. If you don't believe me, how many kids you got? Me? One. Do, don't God love you and your kid? Mm -hmm. How many kids you have? Three. Three. Don't God love you and your God, God want to raise up a team. God just didn't raise up Jesus. He raised up 12 men. 13 with Judas. And then he sent out another 70. God want to raise a 21st century apostleship demands team ministry. You got to have your pastors back. You got to have your apostles back. If your dream or take to to life, you must first work on the dream of others. Let me say that again. If your dreams are to take life, you must first work on the dream of others. Joseph the dreamer had to work on the dreams of other men before his own dreams came to fruition. Your dreams must die so that others may live. Joseph dreamed, but look at, look at what he had to do. He had to work on Potiphar's dream. He had to work on the butler's dream. He had to work on the baker's dream. He had to interpret Pharaoh's dream. Who dream are you interpreting? Whose dream are you working on? Let me tell you something. I'm going to tell you this. I worked at West Angeles seven days a week. I was treated like I was on staff and wasn't. But before I was treated like I was on staff, when I was a nobody, when I came off a of skid row, when I didn't have no money, when I was working at McDonald's, I was at the church every day. My wife would ask me, why are you at the church so much? I was in love with God. And I still am in love with Him. The only difference, I'm not teaching evangelism now, I'm teaching school of the prophets. But I still teach evangelism. I worked on Bishop Blake's dream. And when God gave me that, that prayer life for one year and he gave me evangelism, you know what I found out? That evangelism was the heart of Bishop Blake. And so out of all those people that was there before me, I had his heart. God will give you your man of God. God will give you your man of God's desires. Your woman of God. You got to love your woman of God as if she's a man. David says that he loved Jonathan the way a man loves a woman. That's the way you fall in love with your man of God, your woman of God. They, you got to love them. You got to love them in their weakness. Love them in their bad breath. Love them when they ain't dressed properly. That's real love. If you can't love me when I'm low, I don't need you to love me when I'm up. You understand what I'm saying? So let's read this. We're we'll close and take a two minute break. And the time, let's read this question is true or false. And Anytime the part becomes more important than the whole, we have missed the purpose. True or false? Your own vision must die in order for it to yeah, true. true. You must work on the dream of others before your dream will live. We want to thank each and every one of you for the School of the Prophets. We're going to take a little five-minute break, three-minute break, and we're going to...